Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Founder Series, where we are interviewing the founders of the products that our customers love, um, customer or companies that SmartBear has acquired uh, over the years, um, where the founders still play a huge role here in the development of uh, the further development of their products, the creation of new products, and this series is just for us to get a chance to kind of introduce these founders to you and kind of show um, uh, a little glimpse of what all went into the founding of these companies um, and, and where they as entrepreneurs found success, challenges, where they have advice for other entrepreneurs and just uh, a lot of insights that they can share with, with our audience. So today we are here with Yoko Kasila. Uh, Yoko is one half of the founding duo behind Bitbar, uh, a company that SmartBear acquired in 2019. So Yoko, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, can you kind of give your, your current title here? Uh, of course, we've already revealed that it was that you're one of the founders yeah. of Bitbar and then just kind of the, uh, the early days uh, of that company. Yes, yeah, so I'm currently a product manager for Bitbar and uh, cross-browser testing uh, platform here at, at SmartBear. So we're covering both the mobile uh, app testing and the web testing as a device cloud. And yeah, we found, uh, co-founded uh, Bitbar in late 2009. So it was on the aftermath of the, the previous uh, uh, downturn, downturn, which is actually yeah. a, a good, you know, in hindsight, it is a very good time to start, start companies. Yeah, that happens, that happens a lot. There's a lot of companies that have come out of, you know, hard times where people needed solutions to, uh, to challenges or saw opportunities for when we come out of those harder times, um, opportunities for, for exciting companies and, and offerings. Uh, after that. So something else that people might find really interesting about uh, Bitbar and yourself is that you founded this company with your brother. Uh, and yes. I'd love to, know, love to know a little bit more about how the two of you decided to go into business together and where, you know, maybe looking back on that, where founding a company with a, a relative, especially someone as close as a sibling, maybe gave you any, adva any advantages or even any challenges that your, your closeness, you know, was the result of. Yeah, that's true. We, we are a family company. So, <laughs> so, so that's, uh, that's unique, unique about this, uh, this team. Uh, also, it was a bit unique the way how we started it, because um, unlike many companies who are started, started to kind of implement an idea, for us, it was more about timing. So, so uh, in uh, 2009, I was, uh, I was working at, at Nokia on the, on the mobile platform they had uh, at a time called Symbian. And uh, you know, there was a downturn for Nokia as well, and they were handing out uh, a fairly generous uh, separation packages, which, be, which became uh, kind of the, the initial capital for starting Bitbar. Right. And at the same time, my brother was uh, finalizing his MBA, and he was like, yeah, well, I don't feel going back to his previous company either. So, so we, we were more like, yeah, okay, now we have kind of a time and, uh, and the, a bit of capital, and, uh, and actually we had already worked together um, 10 years prior. So on the, on the kind of previous uh, kind of dot, dot com uh, uh, bubble. Uh, so, so we basically knew how, how it is to work together. And actually the other uh, core, uh, core part of the Bitbar team were on, on that startup uh, back, back in the day. So actually the discussion was more like, uh, you know, let's, let's put the band back together and uh, take it from there. And, That's uh, awesome. I, I, have, I have two two kids uh, currently who are uh, uh, thirteen and ten, and they're at that like at each other's throats, fighting yeah. age, where they can't even be in the room together for ten minutes. But I mean, I, I I can envision them doing something similar because they are they each have a very unique set of skills, personalities, interests, that kind of thing, and are so lacking what the other brother has that I think they'll Absolutely. really yeah, need that. And so yeah, us, I can really envision yeah. them. Yeah, same for us. We are quite different kind of uh, characters are we complementing each other the other one is that of course when you're siblings um there's this very fashionable brutal honesty so, so you right. get like immediate feedback uh, yeah right away and there's no, no no holding back back so of course it, it makes you kind of uh, uh improve much faster and also in, in the kind of bad times, you know, it's, it's very unlikely that kind of your brother would leave the company for a better uh, job offer or, you know, that sort of thing that, you know, quite often break the founding teams. teams. So, so, you know, it's that sort of a commitment that goes, goes deeper than just, just like um, being, being colleagues. Yeah. 
That's great. Yeah, I thought about that. that that's a really good point because, you know, you, you work so long with a certain team, you get so used to how that team operates, communicates, collaborates, their availabilities, and then someone can leave and it can completely disrupt the entire chain of, of how things work. And then you you find you replace them with someone who is, you know, you're not going for the exact same person, but you try and find yeah. someone who can work at that same speed, but to, to lose, you know, the the other half of a brother duo would be would be yeah. huge. Yeah, exactly. And I saw that quite often in Silicon Valley, where I was uh, four years uh, setting up the big bar operations that, you know, many of our competitors were, you know, the one of the founders get offer from Google or Facebook and they leave. And, you know, that's that's the end of end of that startup. Yeah. So it does happen quite often. Yeah. So how did you and Marco identify the need for a company slash you know, solution like Bitbar? Were the was it going to were the, were the capabilities or um, or the, the features that you were kind of envisioning this company to be able to provide, were those things that were going to help you out and the work that you were doing? Or was this specifically so you saw for mobile testers or developers? How did you kind of see uh, this is something that could really be successful? Um, well, like, like I said, when we started, we didn't have like a concrete product idea. So we, for the first year or year and a half, we, we were doing customer projects like a professional service uh, projects uh, doing mobile apps and websites and, 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 and that sort of uh, things that we identified that the tooling side on a mobile was pretty immature. So on the website, web, web development side, we were able to use uh, uh, things like uh, the continuous integration services or, or like testing, uh, testing on the cloud. But then on the, on the mobile side, there, there was, there was uh, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. so, so first we, um, the first idea was that we will take the kind of the continuous integration process to the cloud. So basically that uh, the application developers can build the app or, or kind of compile the app on the cloud. Mm -hmm. And uh, we made like a rough, rough demo or, or kind of a rough uh, prototype of that and started uh, uh, going around uh, presenting that to, to prospective customers and uh, like a real, uh, real uh, customer development style. And uh, actually the feedback was that, well, this is not the exact problem we have. The problem is more on the testing side that how do we actually test on all those 40 different Android phones that are out there? So, so uh, at that time it, it was still, uh, still like a manageable problem. And uh, we, we solved that as a, like a project for a customer first. It was like an on-premise or, or like a custom on-premise setup. And uh, then we started going around on, on like uh, different trade shows and kind of Android meetups and that sort of things. And we, we had this like a small uh, case, suitcase, uh, case, uh, uh, having, it had like about 10 phones and, and we were showing that, you know, you can run the test on all these 10 phones at the same time. And the feedback there was that, well, that's nice, but we don't have those phones either. So, so, mm. so then we went back again and, uh, and in 2000, like late, 2011, we launched the, the BitBar cloud, or actually at the time it was called Testroid because it was only for Android, uh, so it didn't support iOS. And uh, that cloud had like uh, about 40 or 50 different Android phones, so it was covering a lot of the Android market at the time. And, uh, and that's, that's how it started. And, and there was uh, actually a couple of like, uh, nice anecdotes that you know when once the service was up and we had the online payments or kind of the self-service mm -hmm. the first customer who signed up and paid was um i think it was google and the second one was LinkedIn. wow and then within a month there was a facebook so so it was pretty clear for us that where we have to go and then then um, actually a year later we we set up the um the Bitbar Silicon Valley operations. <laughs> we were like, you know, this is where the customers must be. Yeah, that's great. That's yeah. that's that's fascinating. Yeah, I love the the kind of iterative uh, improvement, additions, those kind of things. Of of it's hard to identify the exact solution, no matter how much research you do, how many beta tests you run, focus groups, all of those kind of things. Those yeah. those problems uh, they change over time. They change via the region. They change via the type of software these teams are creating. And it's it's yeah. you're you're unlikely to to nail the exact problem and come up with the one solution needed for everybody. Like that, as they always say, there's no silver bullets. There's no single solution that's going to work for every customer. So to be able to keep kind of adding to it, differentiating your product your offerings is, is great. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Well, we've already spoken to our founders of Cucumber, who are based in the UK, across, I think, Scotland and 
uh, and in London as well, I believe. And then our hip test founders we spoke with who are from France. So I'd love to kind of give the opportunity for you to give uh, uh, your home country of Finland some credit. I'm, I'm a big believer in the, you know, your surroundings and your environments influencing your, your things like entrepreneurship, your views on the world, your, your ideas for, for what you can contribute to the world. So is, is there an entrepreneurial spirit in Finland that you could say actually um, motivated or supported you and, and your brother in those early days? Is there anything about Finland in particular that, that made, that was a great place to, to launch your company? There is, there is, and, and especially after the kind of the 2009, 2010, when uh, kind of Nokia laid off a lot of people, there were actually a lot of uh, kind of a public efforts to support uh, startups. And there, there was actually, we, we also received a good amount of like public money to to um, you know, expand the business, especially the U.S. and uh, and yeah, there are there are some kind of very large and successful startups, like uh, for instance, um, Rovio, the makers of Angry Bird games, mm -hmm. and and also Supercell. Uh, you know, they do the Heyday and yeah. and Clash of Clans and those. So kind of mobile gaming or gaming in general is is has been very uh, very typical uh, startup. Uh, area or startup scene and actually those both those two companies have been our early customers and they've been kind of supporting us us uh, and we've been able to kind of follow the scale scale that they they have reached so definitely there's um uh, there's a good supporting uh, environment and actually our um, headquarters of the office was uh, until all the way until through the acquisition it was on one of the the biggest startup hubs in scandinavia there's like uh, over 300 companies under, oh, wow. under one roof that are all, all like a VC backed and, and uh, kind of a early, early, early stage startups. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, and then I wanted to also ask you about uh, open source. Um, you know, Smart Bear supports a number of open source uh, communities and products like Cucumber and Soap UI and Swagger. And so we're, we're, big, we're big fans of it here. And I know that open source plays a big role in, in mobile development and testing as well with, with uh, um, solutions like Appium. And so uh, we always love kind of giving the open source community their, their due and their credit as well. And so I'm just going to ask you as far as what kind of, what kind of open source uh, communities, products, mindsets, you know, that those kind of things kind of played a role in, in, in Bitbar's success over the years. Yeah, so mobile development is very open source driven. Of course, uh, Android is fully open source and all the tool chains and tools around Android are, are open source. So it was kind of natural for us to, to kind of uh, play, play in, in, in that, uh, uh, in, in that uh, technology space. But also uh, we did uh, make a kind of conscious decision, decision on the very early, early states that we will embrace the open source and, and don't bring any, uh, don't build anything closed. So, so all, all our APIs are open and, and well documented and, and kind of everything has to be so closed that even uh, so open that even the customers can kind of take their stuff and, and run it elsewhere. So, so we don't uh, build that sort of lock in. I right. think we benefit from the fact that we, we kind of uh, em embrace their open source and on the testing side, you know, the kind of the Selenium and Appium and those are get, getting to mainstream and be most popular frameworks. So actually we saw that uh, some of our customers who, who started as a very closed systems, all of them have to have to support now the, the very least their Seleniums and Appiums and the other, other open source. Uh, so, so that's kind of where the test automation frameworks are going definitely. Yeah, for sure. And then just have one other question for you here at the end or a two-parter, I guess, you know, like you said at the very beginning that the, the point of this founder series that we're calling it is to not only show people kind of the, the, the insights or to let the founders here at Smart Bear uh, share their insights, but also to provide some insights just for other entrepreneurs who either have just launched a company or are considering doing it or are not sure where to start, what to avoid, what to look out for, what, what, what um, to get excited about. So I was going to ask what have been some of the most rewarding things about your own journey as an entrepreneur? And then secondly, for people who may be considering joining you as an entrepreneur, that do you have any advice for them that you either wish you would have known going into it or things that you've seen over time or things that they can uh, maybe look to avoid or, or, or should, uh, should focus on in those early days? Yeah, well, uh, I think the most rewarding is kind of to see the, the long-term customers that we have. That there are some customers who have stayed with us like seven, eight years. And when we initially started with them, I would have never thought that, you know, eight years later, we are still, still uh, working together and, and yeah. kind of building it. It's like, you know, 
It's like a old married couple almost. You know, you, you, right. you spend so much time with the customer that you, you've got to know them very well. Uh, mm -hmm. The second one, actually, for more like a, for European uh, entrepreneurs or startups, that uh, for us it was a big um, a kind of sea, sea change when we uh, moved or expanded the US. So definitely, I would ex advise everyone to try to go to the US market as fast as you can, because you know it, it may be easy to get deals from your backyard very early on. But kind of if you if you can actually make it successful in the U.S. market, the customers are you know, it's it's a bit more sophisticated market. Customers are more more kind of demanding, and if you can make it there, you know you will grow much faster. So you know uh, when we were acquired, uh, about seventy percent of our, our business came from U.S. So definitely for European startup that go go to U.S. early early that that will make you much better. Nice. That's really good. Yeah. That, you're the first one to offer any kind of advice for just for the European kind of entrepreneurs that are yeah. out there or desirable. So that's, that's great. Thanks so much. Yeah. That's about all that we uh, had today. Um, for everyone who's watching, uh, we just certainly encourage you to check out the other episodes. Like I said, we, we have some recorded already for a number of our, of our, our products here at Smart Bear, and we have a, a, a lot to come as well. So I want to thank you for joining us on this episode of the Founder Series. This has been with Yuko Kasila, um, one of the two founders of Bitbar. Um, Yugo, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much.